or Jesus Christ, you said, fasted 40 days and 40 nights for justification. Give us self-discipline in our sanctification. But we're with Professor Leslie Williams' Faith Untouched, A Short Life in Cranmer, Chapter 3. We're going to be talking about Henry VIII, but it's got a collect here. Almighty God, which does see that we have no power of ourselves to help ourselves. Keep thou us outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may def be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body, from all evil th soul thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Born the second son of Henry the Eighth, Henry the Eighth was destined for the church. His other older brother for the crown, Arthur and Henry's father, Henry the Seventh. Let me just fast forward here a little bit. There we go. Had made a politically correct and lucrative marriage for his firstborn with Catherine of Aragon, daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. Henry Arthur died 1502. Their father decided that Arthur's wife should then marry his younger son Henry, thus keeping the Spanish alliance intact. When the first questions arose over the biblical prohibitions posed in Leviticus 18 and 20 concerning a man's betrothal to a brother's widow, authorities in both Spain and England sought a papal dispensation allow the fair-haired young Henry to marry the older Catherine. Though irregular, the quest was also politically expedient for everyone involved. December 23, 1503, Julius II decreed Arthur's marriage null, decided Henry's marriage legal and sanctified from the church's point of view. Henry was 13. Catherine waited in limbo for six years until the marriage. Henry, Henry married her in 1508, seven weeks after he took the throne. Catherine bore him several children, all of whom died except a girl, Mary, born in 1516. The problem was that England needed a male heir to ensure peace under the new and potential fragile Tudor dynasty. The only time a woman had attempted the English throne, Matilda, 1136, the country was thrown into war. Henry briefly considered his illegitimate son, Henry Fitzroy, as a possibility for the crown, making him Duke of Richmond when he was six loading him with titles and property. But even Fitzroy was a little iffy proposition. The dukes and nobles, some with royal blood themselves, circled, hungry for power, and no one knew for certain if they would accept a bastard as a king. At any rate, Fitzroy died in 1536. Henry VIII's father had become king after a long and bloody civil war. Henry VIII's children, Mary and Fitzroy, held weak positions. So as the years passed, Henry VIII became obsessed with providing a stable heir. The people backed him in desiring a smooth transition from king to king. Nobody wanted that much bloodshed again. By the 1520s, after a decade of marriage, Henry began to fear that he'd fallen under the curse of the Leviticus 2021. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing, they shall be childless. As early as 1522, Henry's confessor, Longland, explained to him God's judgment on the invalid dispensation. Henry believed that his marriage was morally wrong 
and he was receiving divine retribution for marrying his brother's wife. Others, such as John Fisher, acting as Catherine's advocate, pointed to Deuteronomy 25.5, in which the man was encouraged to marry his dead brother's wife to carry on the family line. Taking his position with a vengeance, Henry set out to prove that the earlier papal dispensation allowing him to marry Catherine had been wrong, causing God to curse him with childlessness. Henry wanted his marriage with Catherine annulled so that he could marry someone else and produce a male heir. The catch was that no one could disannul the marriage except the church. Otherwise, the union would be illegal and the offspring would be bastards. Canon law demanded the Pope's approval. During the 50 years from 1378 to 1439, the papacy had split into as many as three divisions with three popes. Though the Council of Constance, 1417, ended the schism, the reform of church authority remained a problem. Who had greater authority, the Pope or councils? The papacy had emerged from those years as autocratic as before. Also prominent at the time was the medieval idea of a united Christendom. The Western world, excluding England, which was not an official part of the Holy Roman Empire, was basically one entity under two heads, temporal and spiritual. The empire consisted of many separate kingdoms loosely organized under the emperor and the church formed an international organization run by the Pope. Unfortunately, emperors and popes lusted after each other's power, vying for control. Popes could excommunicate emperors and kings, and monarchs could control popes with royal troops. Still, until the 16th century, when the principalities began to evolve into strong, independent nations, Western Christendom had remained united in a delicate balance of power. When Henry's troubles began, the Roman Emperor, who was none other than Charles V, Catherine's nephew. In 1527, Charles V sacked Rome. The Pope Clement VII therefore couldn't decide in favor of the English king without exciting the wrath of the man who held him captive. Charles V was no less a libertine than Henry VIII. But because he protested the annulment, not necessarily out of affection for his aunt, or because he felt it was morally wrong, but because of family pride. Growing desperate, Henry knew the score. The moral issue of the annulment presented no problem. Other monarchs had been granted annulments on lesser grounds by simply paying a fee. The problem was political. <laughs> The weary, exhausting battle between Henry VIII and the Pope involved a continent-wide debate with the unity of the Holy Empire at stake. For two or three years, canon law experts, civilian lawyers, and other learned men studied the problem, debating and disputing. Catherine had her team of experts, and Henry had his. Both sides sent commission, commissions to Rome, beleaguering Clement VII with envoys and intimidation. Henry, on the one hand, threatened to destroy the Catholic Church of England. On the other side, Catherine's nephew, Charles V, threatened to control Italy and hold the Pope hostage. Caught in the politics and held captive, the Pope could not make a decision without losing England or starting the war. 
So Clement the Seventh sat on a fence, playing Henry, stalling for time. The Pope confided to the Bishop of Tarbes in secret that he would be glad if the new marriage took place, just so long as he didn't have to make the decision. Then in 1528, military actions changed the situation. The French commander Lautrec defeated the Spanish in Naples. Clement VII saw Charles V's Spanish domination coming to an end. Therefore, he could afford to grant Henry a trial with the possibility of a favorable outcome. Clement sent Lorenzo Campeggio to England for an ecclesiastical trial, but he told him to go slowly because of the situation in Italy remained volatile. Campeggio arrived in Dover, 1528, September, ordered to meet with Catherine first and try to get her to renounce the marriage. Campeggio said to the queen, renounce the world, madame, enter a nunnery. Catherine recoiled at the idea of giving up her marriage, knowing full well that her daughter would be declared illegitimate. She wanted her daughter to ascend the throne as legitimate heir. The Pope knew Henry was pressuring the English Cardinal Wolsey to hasten the process, so he cautioned his legate in England to use craft and delay. Campeggio employed on a very dilatory method, slow travel, case of gout, never ending excuse of waiting for fresh instructions. Finally, in May 1529, the long awaited ecclesiastical trial started in the Great Hall of the Black Friars. Henry, who had suffered on the teetotter of events for two years, was ecstatic. Unfortunately, just as the trial started, the Pope rushed news to Campeggio that the Emperor the game military victory in Italy and instructed Campeggio that he was not under any of the circumstances to announce a decision. Henry remained ignorant of the Pope's reversal. On July 3rd, 30, Henry's hopes were obliterated. Campeggio closed down a crucial history, hearing in the court dispute postponing it until October, oh, that'll go for well with Henry. He used the excuse of the Roman custom of adjourning the ecclesiastical courts during harvest. In one fell swoop, Campeggio sabotaged the king's efforts and bested the king's representative, Cardinal Wolsey. Henry felt mocked. Wolsey's power started to crumble and the Pope's integrity suffered a fatal blow in Henry's eyes. Devastated Henry and his entourage traveled fitfully to his palace at Greenwich. By chance, the plague swept through Cambridge in the summer of 1529. Since medical knowledge had not advanced enough to prevent or cure the epidemic, only sure way not to catch the plague was to leave town. Thomas Cranmer, accompanied by two of his students to Waltham Abbey in Essex, to stay with their parents, the Cressys, as Mrs. Cressy was also kin to Cranmer. They would all lodge there in safety until the plague passed. In early August, a few days after Black Fire, Flyer, Friars trial. Two of Henry's advisors in Henry's gate had cause turned up at the Cressy House, Dr. Stephen Gardner, Henry's secretary, and Dr. Fox, Henry's almoner, offsuit to disperse financial aid on behalf of the king. These two men served as the chief defenders of the king's cause and the difficult issue of Henry's annulment. At supper time, all three doctors met around the table. Gardner and Fox were surprised to find Cranmer at the house. 
he explained about the plague and why he was there. Since they all knew each other, the king's secretary and almoner entertained Cranmer by telling him about the recent events surrounding the king's frustration with the annulment proceedings. They wanted to know Cranmer's opinion of the whole affair. Cranmer said that he really couldn't speak to the issue because he hadn't studied it, although he had apparently been on the fringes of the activity. However, he observed that the problem had been beaten to death in the ecclesiastical courts of canon law, a tactic that was getting nowhere. Cranmer suggested a different emphasis in the royal plan of action. He told Gardner and Fox that the issue of marrying a brother's wife should be discussed with scholarly defines and decided on the basis of the authority of scripture. Forget the canon lawyers, he said. Henry's conscience could be quieted this way rather than him suffer those miserable day delays because the Pope was prolonging the decision. Cranmer concluded that the learned men in England and on the continent should decide the outcome based on the Bible. Their authority ought to end all this shilly shallying. <laughs> in short, Cranmer felt that the question should focus on the legality of Henry's marriage to his brother's wife. Secondly, the authority of the Bible should trump papal authority. Third, that the majority opinion should be accepted as final. He added a prescient comment. The king isn't taking proper advantage of his own power. Nobody, no other potentate, not even the Pope, should have any say about what goes on within the king's own realm. He himself holds under God the supreme government of England in all areas, both civil and ecclesiastical. In fact, a similar plan had been broached prior to Cranmer's suggestion issue had been discussed and a vote taken in Henry's favor at the University of Paris in October. Cranmer simply underscored the validity of the approach. Basically, the plan Cranmer suggested was to get wide public base from experts in theology using the scriptures as a foundation, thereby forcing the Pope to come around Universities back then often served as supreme tribunals for scientific and other questions. Cranmer's idea created politics of a different sort. The pressure of international public opinion. His plan also moved the question from the arena of canon law into the arena of theology. Gardner and Fox left Waltham relieved and armed with a French approach to the mess. <laughs> She's so basic. <laughs> I like it's refreshing. It's a simplification of things. And it's put in a nice uh, kind of Latimerian way, direct. <laughs> they knew full well that the wrath of the king fell swiftly on those who failed to get results. In other words, Henry paid by results. That's worth a, a little turn of phrase there and they hoped they would escape downfall, unlike the hapless Cardinal Colsey, Wolsey who died, accused of treason after the king stripped him of power. They wrote eagerly to President, after Cranmer's idea of the king, unaware he'd offered monumental advice, Cranmer headed back to Cambridge and then home to a visit to Nottinghamshire. Greenwich Palace, a sumptuous red brick castle built on the river's edge near London, served at this point as Henry VIII's most common domicile and showplace. Born there, Henry had refurbished the palace to include grounds for elaborate jousting tournaments, masquerade balls in its massive collection of swords, shields, and weapons 
He held lavish parties at Greenwich to keep the English people on his side during this difficult time. It was Grant to Greenwich that Henry had gone to fume, furious at the cardinals and despondent at his own impotence to get his annulment, the annulment he wanted. The following day, the king called Gardner and Fox to him and asked what to do to end this, this unending fear. He speculated that they'd have, have, have to send a new commission to Rome and lamented that only God knew when the business would end. Fox, the almoner, said he thought of a better way for the king rather than making yet another trip to Rome. He'd stumbled on an idea at Waltham. Eager to hear what Fox meant, the king asked who had given him the idea of a better way to handle things. Fox informed the king that he and Gardner had run into an old acquaintance, Thomas Cranmer, when they were staying at Master Cressy's house. They were discussing how to solve the annulment issue and settle the king's conscience at the same time. Cranmer thought the next step should be to let international call scholars try the king's question using the authority of the Bible and from there to proceed to a final sentence. At this point, Gardner was irritated with his colleague because, according to John Fox, he'd wanted to claim the idea for himself and the almoner had given Cranmer the credit for the plan. Gardner tried to color the scheme, making it look <laughs> as if they'd come up with the solution, but the king asked point blank where this Dr. Cranmer was. Was he at Waltham? The two advisors said that they had left him there. The king said he wanted to speak with Cranmer and told them to send for him immediately. He said that man has the so by the right ear. If I had known this device but two years ago, it had been in my way a great piece of money, and he had also rid me out of much disquietness. They sent for Cranmer, but since he'd already left Cambridge for Nottinghamshire, they sent a post after him to bring him to London. When he, Cranmer arrived in London, he began to quarrel with Gardner and Fox. Why had they embroiled him in this huge, volatile public problem when he hadn't begun to research the issue properly? Cranmer begged them to make excuses to the king so that he wouldn't have to face Henry VIII himself. Cranmer's distress was understandable. A timid but thorough scholar, he felt he didn't have the proper background to face the king on this burning national issue trying to be helpful during the supper time conversation with the old friends, he'd gotten trapped into the terrifying position of becoming a key player in this national disaster, involved with a strong-willed king. Gardner and Fox tried to make excuses for Cranmer, but their efforts were in vain. The more they tried to explain why Cranmer didn't feel qualified to appear before the king, the more the king chided them. No excuse was accepted. The king insisted that Cranmer be brought before him without delay. When Cranmer arrived, the king asked his name to make sure he was the same man Clint Fox and Cranmer Gardner had run into. Cranmer affirmed this to be true. The king repeated the plan they outlined at supper. Cranmer agreed that, yes, that's what he said. As Cranmer looked around at the richly paneled room, probably wilting inside and wishing that he'd never opened his mouth, the king told Cranmer that he thought Cranmer had the right angle on the problem and that his troubled conscience could have been assuaged much earlier if he'd done it that way in the first place. Henry asked Cranmer, no, he commanded him to abandon all other business affairs and oversee Henry's cause and to implement his plan to the best of his ability. Here's how the king explained his situation. 
he didn't want an annulment of his marriage to the queen if he could be convinced that the marriage was holy and not against God's laws. If the marriage was sanctified, there was no reason for him to seek such extreme measures because no prince ever had such a gentle, loving, and obedient companion as a wife. However, the king was afraid his marriage was doomed by God and therefore unholy. The queen came from noble spot stock and had many noble virtues, but Henry said he'd be happier to stay married to her, but he didn't think God was pleased with the marriage. The scene was set in Henry's elegant, newly furnished hall, surrounded with a display of weaponry meant to intimidate all of Europe. Cranmer wore his scholar's robes and faced his sovereign, a wily and determined king dressed in royal bodice and leggings. What Henry didn't say weighed as heavily as what he did. Though Catherine was a good woman, she couldn't produce sons, and Henry felt judged for marrying her in the first place. This conversation revealed Henry's dual preoccupation to get an annulment and assuage his conscience at the same time. He wanted God's stamp of approval on his own desire, and he picked Cranmer for this slippery and delicate business. Henry wanted to look at this Gordian knot with an indifferent eye and with as much dexterity as lieth in you. that for your part to handle the matter for the discharging of both of our consciences. It is interesting how the king roped Cranmer in. Not only did he command him to participate, but he also intertwined Cranmer's conscience with his own for a way of achieving the resolution to the problem. Cranmer felt inadequate. He didn't want to meddle in such a matter. He pleaded with the king to commit the trial and examination to the best scholars of Cambridge and Oxford, leaving him out of it. The king said no. Cranmer could delegate to others, but the king charged Cranmer to write down his thoughts and relate them back to him. He could not hide from the challenge. Here we end chapter 3. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.